Good morning. Let's stand together as we come together. It's good to hear everybody fellowshipping together one, uh, one with one another this morning. Welcome you to Grace Assembly. If you're joining us online, we welcome you as you join us as well. Got a lot of great things planned for today. We're going to begin with our scripture reading in just a moment, but we're going to take just a moment and uh, remind ourselves. know how much we love them and appreciate all that they do for the church here. Would you just uh, celebrate them this morning as we begin the service and give them a hand clap of appreciation for our pastors today. Amen. Well, let's begin our worship this morning with our scripture reading from the book of Isaiah chapter 45 beginning in verse 22. Let's read aloud. Here we go. Out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Surely shall one say, In the Lord have I righteousness and strength. Even to him shall men come, and all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed. In the Lord shall all the seed of Israel be justified. And shall glory. Can we read that first one more time? Let's read it again. Here we go. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. Would you give the one true God a hand clap of praise this morning? Yeah. 
because of his salvation, we have a blessed hope today, amen, that one day we're going to see him in glory, be with him in heaven forevermore. Aren't you looking for that day? Hallelujah.
Remain standing as we go to prayer this morning. We're going to read the names of those that need prayer today. Let's pray for Quentin Kirkland. Let's pray for Sister Louise Howard. Uh, we just found out that she has had a stroke, and we uh, want to certainly pray for her. Let's remember Dallas Jones and Susan Cook. Let's pray for Chris Amons. Um, it's a man that has had COVID and, and did uh, well enough to go home, but he's back in the hospital with some kind of heart condition, and they have him in a, uh, an induced coma. But we know that God can minister to him and his wife. And he has three children that are taking this very hard. So we want to lift them up today. Let's pray for Ruby Batten. This is Sister Dolores Booth's sister. And also for Sister Booth's great, uh, uh, she had a second heart transplant that is trying to reject. And we're praying that God's going to intervene there. Let's remember uh, James Smith. Jesse Collins had an unspoken request. I want to thank you for those that helped me pray. I was able to make a decision and be at peace with it, and I know that God helped me. Uh, let's pray for our military, our missionaries, the unsaved, and the unspoken. If you have a request for any of those, let me know, and we're going to pray with you. I wanted to share one thing with you. In 2 Kings, in the fourth chapter, Elisha came up on a woman who had nothing left in her home. She was going to make a meal for her um, no, I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong story. She had nothing in her home. Her husband had died, and uh, she told the prophet, you know, that she didn't know what to do. They were going to come and take her children because that was going to pay her penalty for the bills that she couldn't pay. He told her to go into the house and find whatever she could find. She found vessels, and she had oil. But the prophet told her, you go borrow vessels from all of your neighbors. Well, you know what? All my life, I kind of thought, you know, she got little olive oil bottles. You know, that's what I was thinking about. But I just hope that she had enough faith that she went and got those big water urns. And when she began to pour that oil, it filled up every vessel. The small ones, the medium ones, and I hope some of those big old water jugs. And God met her need by her being able to sell that and pay her debts. And I wanted to tell you that story that is true from God's word to let you know that whatever you've got in your house, if it's nothing left but a prayer and a believing heart, God can meet whatever need you have. It could be financially, that's what she needed. When you think that there's no answer, there is an answer. And our God is the one who's going to make that happen. Let's pray together. God, just like this widow woman today, God, we're bringing our vessels, God. We're bringing these needs, God, that are so important to these people. God, needs that only you can intervene for, most of them. But God, we're bringing those vessels today of faith and believing that you're going to fill them, God. You're going to fill them with whatever much heaven for these needs to be met today. God, I thank you for your faithfulness to us. And I thank you, God, that your word is true, that we can depend on it. We can read it and relate to it and know that whatever you have done before, that you can do again, that you're no respecter of persons. I ask you to be with Brother Chris today as he brings us the word. I ask you, God, to give him clarity of voice and mind and open our hearts that we'll understand and receive your word. Bless us as we continue to worship you and we'll give you the praise for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. same old voice tell the same old lies if you're trying to fill the same old holes inside there's a better life if you got pain he's a pain taker if you feel lost he's a way Maker. If you need freedom or saving 
living. He's a prison shaking Savior. If you got chains, He's a chain breaker. We've all searched for the light of day in the dead of night. And we've all found ourselves worn out from the same old fight. Oh, and we've all run to things we know just ain't right. Oh, and there's a better life. Church, there's a better life. If you got pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's the way maker. If you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. Oh, if you believe it, if you receive it. Somebody testify. Do you believe it? Oh, if you receive it, if you can't feel it, somebody testify. Oh, if you believe it, if you receive it, if you can't feel it, somebody testify. Savior, if you got chains, he's a chain breaker. You believe that today? Aren't you thankful for a God who breaks chains? He sets the captive's doors, he makes a way when there seems to be no way. We've all searched for the light of day in the dead of night. And we've all found ourselves worn out from the same old fight. Oh, and we've all run to things that we know just ain't right. When there's a better life, you know there's a better life. Oh, if you got pain, he's a pain taker. God bless you this morning as we're seated for this special announcement. Hope. Without it, we feel lost and alone. But when it's extended in time of need, it can be the turning point in a person's life. That's why Convoy of Hope shows kindness in so many different ways. When the world is turned upside down by disaster, that's often when people need kindness the most. We want to be there to help take necessities in life or access to a new clean water. 
Without them, kids can't think about their futures. Grown. If we want to quickly break the cycle of poverty in a community, we found one of the best ways to do that is by empowering the women within it. The needs in our nation's neighborhoods are real. So are the solutions. A bag of groceries, a haircut, or a pair of new shoes can be what gives people hope for tomorrow. So much of the poverty that exists in America today is in small towns, whose people feel forgotten and neglected world shouldn't mean living far from hope. Join us in our mission to bring hope to those who feel trapped, lost, or discarded. Together, let's change the world. One act of kindness at a time. How are y'all doing today? Good to see y'all this morning. Honor to be here on this special day as we celebrate pastor's appreciation. How many of y'all appreciate your pastor? Amen. Amen. I want to share a few announcements as we get started, and I want to... Um, I want to express my deep gratitude as well. Today at 4 o'clock, Fallen Waters uh, will be a cookout, grilling out. You don't need to bring anything. Everything's provided. Um, you know, bring a, you know, if you got a fold out chair or something like that, but other than that, everything. Tell the guard at the gate that you are with Grace Assembly and there's no charge. Just remember that as you come up to the gate. Uh, there'll be games, volleyball, horseshoes, cornhole. So there's a few of those I'm pretty good at. Anybody wanting to lose today? All right, just come see me. And you can, you can be on my team. That's what I'm. <laughs> uh, gospel music. Uh, bring uh, your fold out chair, lawn chair. It is a recognition of value that's independent of monetary worth, so you can't put a dollar sign on it. Webster's defines gratitude as a feeling of appreciation or thanks. How many of y'all have that feeling this morning? I'm thankful for a pastor, and I'm thankful for a Savior, aren't you, this morning? You can't put a dollar sign on what God has given us, can you? Today, we're celebrating our pastors particularly Pastor Dallas and, and, and Sister Pam. Gratitude, thankfulness, appreciation, all are synonymous, and they mean the same thing, and it's an absolute honor to be here today. I, this is momentous. You know, I, I've told, you know, as a teacher, I've told my students for many years, I said, the way you view people directly affects how you treat people. You know, how you view someone has everything to do with how you treat that someone. If you appreciate them and are grateful, that is going to come out in your actions and in your thoughts and in your, and in your life. And I, I'm, I'm beyond grateful for our pastor, my pastor. Um, 23 years this year. It seems like yesterday we, we celebrate in 20 years. But... For over 25 years, been on staff here at Grace. That's a quarter of a century. You, you can't hardly... Well, but that's not a long time on this end of it, though. That's the thing. It, to, you know, on average. That's the common average if you look it up, 3.6 years. And there's many reasons why pastors might leave a church, burnout, conflict, turmoil, and sometimes God just calls you somewhere else. Yeah. <sighs> 
I want to share a few attributes, I believe, and I know Pastor, if he's like a lot of us, doesn't want a lot of, you know, it's just, you know, but there are a few attributes that I find very strong in Pastor's life. Number one, um, consistency. Sometimes I struggle with consistency, but knowing what vision, he walks that out. Pastor Dallas and Pam have been here for over 23 years. Have there been times they wanted to leave? Let you answer that. Have you guys ever wanted to leave your job? All right. But it's when you don't leave. Amen. It's the staying. How many know God can give you staying power? He can give you staying grace. He can keep you. And thank God for 23 years. Jeremiah 3.15, the Lord promised to give pastors after his heart who would feed his people with knowledge and understanding. And before I get into this sermon, because I want to honor our pastor on pastor's appreciation, and I would also like to preach a message that pastor would appreciate. <laughs> but before I get into this sermon, I want to say a few things that I'm thankful for on a personal level. I'm thankful, number one, for a pastor that feeds good food, gives you the word of God with knowledge and understanding. Pam and I, my wife Pam and I were talking about that last night. That we, the first time we came here, we knew that we were this, you know, we were safe. You know, we knew that it was an environment that was spiritually safe and secure and an environment that we could grow in. I believe, again, another thing I'm thankful for is the fact that Pastor has believed in me and given me an opportunity to grow in my callings and giftings. I was given the opportunity to teach and preach and, and lead, and I'm grateful for that, probably more so than any other time in, in ministry. I'm thankful for positive and constructive feedback that I have received, um, and I'm also thankful that pastor's been there in times when I needed him. There were some times, some dark times of a lot of stress that led to other things. Pastor was there to help me, talk with me, counsel with me, and give me resources I needed. And I, I want to say he's there for you too. If you, haven't, if you haven't taken advantage of that, you make sure you talk to your pastor. I'm thankful for that though, that in times of joy, such as we're in now with, with a child coming. They've rejoiced with us. Pastor's been there in dark times. And there's things that he knows about you and me that only he and you and God know. Because you can trust him. And I'm thankful for that. He's been a pastor to us. He's been an objective voice in times when I was overcome with emotion and needed to make a big decision. He's given me a, an opinion that was wise. He's cared about our spiritual, mental, and physical health as a congregation. He's been there when we needed to talk, and he's helped give us the resources we needed. And this is by no means an exhaustive list. have a real pastor like Pastor Dallas, Pastor Pettis. It is so easy to misunderstand the blessing that God gave you when he gave you a real pastor. So please ask God to constantly remind you of what you have, because remember, how you view someone has everything to do with how you treat them. Ask God to help you have the right view of himself and the ones that he has put over the guardianship of your soul and eternity. Well, this morning as we get started, I have a message. We need to know who we have as a pastor, and we have a good one. We have a great one, in my opinion. But how many of you know we need to also know who we have as a Savior? Amen. Yes. 
We need to know who is in the house. And the title of my message is Understanding Who's in the House. And I'm opening text this morning, if you will go with me, to Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 43. That'll be my opening text this morning. Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 43. Understanding who we have in the house. If y'all are ready, we'll get started. Verse 36, and one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and wipe them with the hairs of her head and kiss his feet and anoint them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had bidden him saw it, he spoke within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that touches him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other owed 50. And when they had nothing to pay, somebody say nothing to pay. He frankly forgave them both. Tell me therefore, which of them will love him the most? And Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, thou has rightly judged. God bless you as you're seated this morning. Some thoughts I want to morning. Number one, Simon the Pharisee had invited Jesus into his house. And if you've been born again this morning, if you have been saved, you invited Jesus into your life. You need to know who's in your house. You need to know who's in your life. And the, first, the second thing I want to talk about is when we don't understand our need of Jesus, we are going to question the worship of others. When, number three, when we don't know him, we will downgrade his one, if you are a Christian, you have invited Jesus into the house. And I want to look back at verse 36 for a moment. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and he sat down to meet. He seemed pretty eager to get Jesus in his home, didn't he? He seemed pretty eager to get this man into his house. And he was invited in. And this was a common practice. Jesus was a, if you will, becoming a VIP. He was a rabbi, he was a teacher, and we know he was more than that. But that's how he was recognized by the people in his life. Jesus in Revelation said this. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, what did he say? I will come into him with him and he with me. This is a physical picture here of what Jesus wants to do spiritually in every one of our lives. Luke 7, 36 through 37 again says that as he desired him, in verse 37 says, a woman in the city which was a sinner, when she knew Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment. At first glance, both the Pharisee and this woman seemed eager to the time. Less, you know, less, you know, if you will, uh, lower economic statuses. They were oftentimes came into people's homes. It was more of a, more of a social um, culture. You know, we don't just let strangers in our house commonly in America. It's a different culture. But the culture here was that many times people would come in and, and maybe take scraps or something. Um, 
But at first glance, both seem anxious to have Jesus in and, and, and minister his needs. Simon had invited Jesus into his home, but he did nothing to minister to the needs of Jesus. In fact, Simon didn't even do what was custom, which was to have Jesus' feet washed and his head anointed. This was customary when you went in somebody's home. Simon didn't even give him that much. He just didn't even give him what was custom, let alone anything beyond custom. But Simon invited him in, but the woman came in. Now, I don't know what Jesus did. It, as you look in context, as you move on it, later on in this passage, he tells this woman, your faith has saved you. So we know that before this, Jesus had performed something in this woman's life that made her so grateful that she would wash his feet with tears. How many of y'all have been so broken lately that you cried enough tears to wash anything? But Jesus had done something so profound in this woman's life. He had forgiven her sins, the very thing she was identified with, and she was so broken and grateful that she washed his feet with her tears and she dried them with her hair and anointed his feet. And she went beyond that. And we're going to talk more about that. I don't know if it was this woman's job or not or if she was at that appointed place, but she certainly filled that role. I want you to notice this. So what, what are we looking at here? You and I usually, when we eat, we pull a chair under the table. But in Jesus' time, the table's going to kind of be the centerpiece, and everyone's just going to be kind of on the floor, leaned up on the table with, you know, kind of with their feet reclined behind them. This, I want you to kind of see that. This is where Jesus was at. He would have been reclined at Simon's table, and this is when this woman came in. You can get the... In verse 38, she stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears. This was an act that wasn't just front and center for all to see. She was behind him at his feet. Um, approval for how devoted she is. In fact, this was actually considered by many to be inappropriate for a woman of her status. It's very possible that Simon and those around would have viewed this if she was a prostitute, and we don't really know if she was or not. Some people say it was Mary Magdalene. We really and so for a woman to be so intimate with Jesus in a place like that, for many, they're going to consider that inappropriate. That's just, that was just the culture of the times. But according to Dr. Thomas Constable, Jesus was probably reclining and eating with his head and arms close to the table, his feet stretched away from it. This was customary for important meals. The woman's sacrificial gift and her tears raised questions that the text does not answer. Was she grateful for some act of kindness that was showed to her? Or was she seeking help by constantly kissing? This means that the woman Not their feet. Jesus, I, I want y'all to just think with me. As I was watching this, or as I was reading this, as pastor was talking to me about, as you read, watching the movie, right? Visualizing what's being said, because the Jews were very visual people. They, they were. Um, I, I, I've questioned, why does she anoint his feet? Well, you know, she would have had to get of Jesus walking into that situation. I don't know where she was at. I don't know what she was dealing with. She was identified as a sinner, a breaker of the law. But she had a special adoration for the feet of the Savior. And I dare say, like Paul said in Romans 10, 
And 15, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things who walk into dark situations. How many of y'all remember when Jesus walked into your dark situation? How beautiful are the feet of the Savior who came, who walked, who entered into our dark situations. And I would like to submit to you that the feet she anointed were the same feet that came to her in her darkest time. They were the same feet that had walked into Simon's house. But he didn't attribute the same value to them. He didn't so much as wash them. Simon did not understand the man who had just walked into his house. Some of you have Jesus in your life, but you do not fully understand who's in your house. Some of you understand that he came to you. He walked to you in your darkest times to find you where you're at. If you're a believer this morning, you invited Jesus into your life and seek to understand who it is that you invited in, that you will not recognize otherwise the worth of who it is you let in. The next thing I'd like to leave you with this morning is that not being intimate with Jesus will make us critical of those who are. Luke 7, 39, when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spoke within himself saying, this man, if he were a prophet, would have known what manner of woman this is that touches him. For she is a sinner. This Pharisee viewed this woman as defiled. And he... And someone who's lost in sin how are they you know Paul it, it, before I read Romans 10 15 it says how are they going to know unless someone goes to them yeah. right. the self-righteous viewed this woman as defiled and we understand that she was forgiven in the eyes of God but Simon viewed her worship as defiling and inappropriate here Maybe. Some of you are here, but you feel nothing towards the Lord. You believe the doctrine. You believe that you, and you may be legitimately saved. How many of you know faith saves us? But you don't feel anything towards God or his people. Perhaps you view the worship of others today as distracting and inappropriate. I am all for order. done came at times when other viewed them as distractions he healed a woman 12 years with an issue of blood while he was on the way to heal Jairus's daughter 
He wasn't his he had a purpose. He had an itinerary and you're here today and you do need a miracle you understand see with Jesus y'all we can get when you don't know him you're going to downgrade him in your thinking Listen to what the Pharisee did. Listen to what Simon did in Luke 7, 39-40. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spoke with himself. How many of you know the heart can tell some lies, can it? The human, the, the, human uh, the fallen mind can give you the ideas you need. That's why you need to stay in the Word of God. You need God's ideas. Because I promise you, there'll be some ideas in your mind. And Simon began to think within himself. How I many you know, it's not always the words that come out of your mouth. Most of the time, we say the right things. But it's the things we think within ourselves. Simon, if this man were a prophet, he would have known, because prophets know is what he's saying. He would have known her character, for she is a sinner. And Jesus said to him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto you. And he says, Master, say on. I want you to see the regression here in Simon's thinking. Number one, Jesus was the son of the living God, wasn't he? He was the word of God that created the universe. He was more than a prophet. He was more than a teacher. He was both of those, but he was the son of the living God. But Simon did not recognize him as the son of God. Number one, Simon said if he were a prophet, already lowering Jesus from who he really was. He, he's now all of a sudden, because Jesus is letting this woman do what she's doing, she, he's letting her pour out her heart to him. He's not even a prophet anymore to me. Now, he wouldn't say that to Jesus, but Jesus knew what he was thinking. And he said, Simon, I have something to say. And he said, Master, say on. You see, Master meant teacher, rabbi. So Jesus went from a prophet to a teacher. But I want you to look at this for a moment. While Simon is downgrading the Savior's identity, this. Pastor just taught about this a lot. The devil likes to villainize God, make a villain out of him. Well, if God loved you, you wouldn't be struggling. If God loved you, your loved one wouldn't have died or you, you'd be able to pay the bills better. God's not a villain, but if you get away from intimacy with him, other thoughts are going to fill your mind. Yeah. And you're going to begin downgrading Jesus and God just like Simon did. He's going to go from being the God who can do it. don't even know if he really exists. You can look at atheists who used to be healing evangelist. Dan Barton, who leads Freedom From Religion Foundation, Madison, Wisconsin, used to be an assembly of God evangelist, saw people healed, saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, and now he's the leading atheist in probably the, the world, but especially in the United States. How does one go from believing Jesus for the impossible, that nothing is impossible to those who believe, being the biggest opponent of Christianity in America. You lose intimacy with him. And you begin to allow other thoughts to infiltrate your mind about the nature and character of God. And you're in trouble. I'm in trouble if that happens. But we can't change who he is. 
Perhaps you're here today and you have just deduced Jesus to a good concept without no real power. Maybe through lack of intimacy, you have not experienced the power of God in a while. Satan, your flesh in this world, will fill your head with many ideas about God. If you're not intimate, you're going to personally deduce who he is in your mind. As we look at this scene, we see one person exalting the gracious, loving Savior, and one reducing Jesus to a mere human teacher with no prophetic insight. (sighs) Which one of these people are you this morning? Are you the one who is reducing God in your mind, looking for every reason not to serve Him? Or are you the one exalting Him? You and I, like Simon, you know, we got to be careful. We got to be careful how we view sinners. We've got to be careful how we view Jesus. Because Simon's view in Jesus is less than a prophet now. We got to be careful. We got to have intimacy so we have the thoughts of God, the thoughts of God towards God. The thoughts of God towards sinners. Those who reject Jesus, how many of you know he still loves them? And he still died for them and wants to see them set free, healed, and delivered. You see, we got to be careful that we don't end up with this mentality like Simon, James, and John. You remember what James and John said, Lord, are you now going to command fire down from heaven and consume them and kill them as Elijah did? talking about people who rejected the gospel and jesus says you do not know what kind of spirit you're of for the son of man did not come to destroy men's lives but what save them that's the heart of god he didn't come to reject the sinner he came to save the sinner please be careful just let's guard what spirit lies within us remember the lord's words in isaiah 55 9 for the heavens are higher than the earth So are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Sounds to me like we need the thoughts of God ruling our life, don't we? Amen. This is the thoughts of God. Read it. Be intimate with it. The fourth thought I want to leave you with this morning, fourth point, is the value that you place on forgiveness is the value that you place on Jesus. Make no mistake about it. John 41 through 43 here in chapter 7 there was a certain creditor now jesus is going to you know teach a parable here to simon i still don't think simon fully gets it even when he answers it but i want to share this with you there was a certain creditor which had two debtors the one owed 500 pence the other 50 and when they had nothing to pay he frankly forgave them both Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most, and he said unto him, you have rightly judged. Who in here has ever been forgiven of a debt that you couldn't pay back? Maybe, maybe a natural debt, monetary money. How many of you have ever been forgiven of a spiritual debt that you couldn't pay back, a sin debt? Man, when you came to Jesus, how much did you have to pay for your salvation? nothing and many times i'm afraid our level of love and gratitude to god is based upon what we think we owed him because if you're here this morning you say well brother chris i wasn't out there living like the devil i got saved at eight years old that doesn't matter you had nothing you had nothing i want to submit to you don't focus on what you think you've done that you needed to be forgiven of but on what it took to forgive you that's how we are grateful i understand people who've been saved out of addiction and depression you understand that i'm different but i don't want you who weren't to lose the understanding that it was the same price that he paid and the same price that you couldn't pay That's what makes us grateful to the Savior. It's not that, well, I don't have as much to be grateful for. You have Jesus. That's everything to be grateful for. This is what the Lord was trying to get Simon to understand. Here's why we should equally praise the Lord. Because all have sinned, Romans 3.23. All were going to hell. All had nothing to pay their sin with. And God paid the price for man's sin with the life of his son. 
all of us have equal right and equal motivation to worship him this morning. God is here. And who doesn't have these reasons to praise the Lord? If you're here this morning and you don't have a reason to praise the Lord, you can leave here with a reason to praise Him. And your sins being forgiven and eternal life coming into you and a promise of heaven, a promise of fellowship with the Lord forever is a reason to praise Him more than anything you think you've ever been forgiven of. It's the price that was paid for forgiveness that gives us equal ground to worship Him fervently. I believe the reason we find ourselves loving Jesus less is because we've lost the vision of who He is and what He's done. When you don't understand what you've been forgiven of, who in here this morning would love for their past to be broadcast on that wall over there or on this screen? You know, all of us, the thought you've thought, the pride you've held inside your heart, the pride I've held inside my heart, the self-righteousness I've had, I have nothing but the grace and love and mercy of God to praise Him for. Nothing that we've done, y'all. None of us come to Him in any higher standing. This is what Jesus was trying to get Simon to understand. You think this woman's the sinner, but you're the one rejecting the Son of God. Who's the greatest sinner in this house? Is it the woman who is now justified by her faith in Jesus or by the one who rejected him? You see this same picture painted out with the Pharisee and the tax collector, and boy, were tax collectors hated. But that Pharisee was in the front of the temple, front and center, that tax collectors in the back beating his chest saying God I'm not even worthy looking at the floor understanding his inadequacy and his sin and his heart but that Pharisee's up there thank God I'm not like this man thank God I attend church regularly I pay my tithes but he was putting him faith in himself and as a result he was unjustified But when you put faith in the Savior, it doesn't matter. You have reason to worship Him. And I want to close with this. I believe this is Pastor's main job, and he does it well. He reminds us under the unction of God's Spirit to consider what great things God has done for us. If you're focusing on others, you're not focusing on the need that lies within you. Instead, Within yourself, you might be justifying yourselves and changing who you think God really is, who you think God can really save. In closing this morning, I would like to analyze and break down portions of this woman's response to Jesus. Y'all doing good this morning? Amen. Let's analyze this woman's response. (sighs) Number one, we find that she brought an alabaster box of ointment. She brought something to her worship. She didn't come saying, I I just want something, but I'm going to bring something. Not only did she bring something, she brought the most valuable something she had in her life. But she brought it out. She did not come to the house empty, but she brought a sacrifice with her. I want to encourage you this morning, be willing to give. And giving is worship. Number two, what did she bring? She brought humility. At his feet, that's humility. And she brought brokenness. She was weeping. She was weeping. I asked you earlier, how many of us has weeped enough to wash our hands, let alone anything else? May God break us again. And I mean a constructive breaking. You're set free when you're broken by God. Strongholds are broken, if you will, through brokenness sometimes. But she ministered. What was the third aspect of her worship? Number one, she brought a sacrifice. Number two, she brought humility. She brought gratitude and brokenness she number three she ministered to Jesus through washing his feet with tears. When is the last time? 
that you and I could say we've shed enough tears of gratitude to wash anything. This was a brokenness that few experience today, sadly. Serving out of an appreciation for Jesus is true worship. Fourthly, she kissed his feet. Now, this wasn't required. This wasn't custom per se, but it was an act of gratitude. She used, and I want to remind you, what did I believe? She loved those feet because they came to her. They walked through the shadows of the darkness and the, maybe the valley of the shadow of death in her life, and they came to her when maybe no one else would come to her. But she not only wanted to see them clean, she wanted to see them loved and adored. And then lastly, she anointed him feet, his feet. This was also done in gratitude, but she did not ask Simon, where's the ointment? But she brought her own. <sighs> Many of us, we come to church, if you let me say that, and we want to feel the anointing. But how many of us are bringing the anointing to church? How many of you come on Sundays hoping that pastor's anointed so that you can be blessed by his anointing? But she brought her own oil. She didn't rely on Simon's. This represents sacrifice on her part. In fact, historians tell us the vial of ointment would have most likely been worn around the neck of a woman of her character and been so much a part of her that she would have even been allowed to wear it on the Sabbath. What, what am I telling you? That this was more than a monetary offering. She literally gave a part of herself to Jesus. She gave tears, she gave kisses, and she gave the most valuable and sentimental possession that she had because she had found a greater possession. And I want to end with this. Romans 12, 1 says this, And I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable. Jesus makes you holy and acceptable so that you can present a body that's holy and acceptable, which is your reasonable service or your spiritual act of worship. What is true of worship to God? You and I, have to, to truly worship Him, you cannot worship God based upon just theological teaching of who He is. That's not personal to you. But how do you worship God? Paul, Paul told the Romans, he says, by the mercies of God, in view of how merciful He's been to you, that's how you can pour out. That's how true worship can emanate from your innermost being towards Jesus. It's not because of who He is theologically, even though it is about who He is theologically but it's about how great and gracious he's been to you and I. This is true worship. Do you know who is in the house? And as we close this morning, I, I, I want to give you time this morning to reflect on the things that have been said. And I want to open these altars up. If you're here this morning and you don't understand who Jesus is, he is the Savior. If you need to be saved this morning, God's dealing with your heart about getting saved. I want to invite you down here. And I'm going to give us a time of reflection. I want you also to think about this morning. Who are you in the house with Jesus? Are you Simon? Who didn't even meet the customary needs of Jesus? Or are you this woman who goes above and beyond out of pure love for Jesus? This wasn't for everyone to see her. But this emanated from a heart that loved Jesus. And so I want to give us some time to respond this morning. And so as Brother Sam sings and plays something that's on his heart, I, I want to call you to action. If that's you this morning in any way, you say, Brother Chris... I want to be like that woman. No, we're not always going to manifest our worship the same way. But for who God created you to be, with the personality God gave you, are you worshiping Him with your whole heart?
is love and gratitude emanating from your deepest, innermost being out of what Jesus has done. If you're here this morning, I'll do it this way as we close. If I could just get every head bowed, every eye closed this morning. This may be more of a traditional way, but I'd like to ask you, as Pastor did last week, if you're here this morning, no one embarrass you, but you're here this morning. I mean, you know, that woman wasn't worried about being embarrassed. She was worried about worshiping her Lord. If you're here this morning, you said, Brother Chris, I need to get my life right with God. I need to be saved. Would you stand for me? Is that you this morning? Anybody this morning? I think last week, a lot of people got right with the Lord, got their, just got back on track maybe. But I want to ask you this morning, you're here this morning, and you say, Brother Chris, I just want to be more of a worshiper. I want to be more, I don't want to just come to this service for what I can get out of it. Because I'll assure you a kingdom principle is this, you'll always get out of it what you put into it. You're here this morning. If that's you, you say, Brother Chris, I want to be more for Jesus. I want to do more for Jesus. I want to love him more. I dare say that's everybody in this house, so if you will all stand with me. Stand with me. And here's what I want us to do. In light of God's mercy, you think about it. You think about the pastor God gave you. That's his mercy to give you a pastor. You think about the gracious way he's dealt with you in your life. And I want you to focus on that, Brother Sam, if you will. Let's just worship the Lord for a few minutes.